there. Well, good morning and thank you. I had difficulty finding the password this morning, so uh, forgive my uh, joining a little bit late. Welcome to the West Valley Unitarian Universalist Church. We are a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Together we support the inherent dignity and worth of all people, along with the right and responsibility to seek a path of truth and meaning that speaks to us. Ours is a welcoming congregation, a status that seems to become more important every day in our splintered society. This official recognition, gained through the efforts of several devoted members of our congregation, means that you are welcome here regardless of your sexual orientation, but you also are welcome here regardless of any labels that may be used to divide one person from another. My name is Terry Mead, and I am the worship associate for this morning's service. Today, we welcome Pax Whitmore, who will speak on the subject of Stoicism and compassion. If you are visiting this morning, we are pleased you could join us and hope you will stay for our period of personal sharing and fellowship following the formal service. I have not received any formal announcements, uh, but I will remind everyone that the men's fellowship continues uh, to meet on Thursday evenings, every other Thursday evening, uh, mostly to uh, check in and uh, talk about what's going on. If you have uh, any questions or would like to uh, uh, be in touch, it is through Zoom, and you can contact either me uh, or Bill uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, get the information about it. If you do have something else to announce, please send me a note uh, via chat at this time, or share it to the congregation as a chat message. Uh, we begin our service with the lighting of the chalice, a symbol of the humanitarian work and sacrifices by members of our faith. Uh, this time, uh, Paul has uh, a virtual image of the um, uh, chalice being lit. And I will simply ask everyone that they take a moment of silence uh, for uh, all those who have um, uh, contracted and suffered from uh, the uh, coronavirus during the past several months. Thank you. Thank you again. Our faith's traditions have evolved from the congregational churches of colonial New England that were based on covenants rather than doctrinal creeds, written agreements democratically adopted by which members proclaimed their common principles rather than beliefs. Our congregation has done the same. Please join me now in a unison reading of our congregational covenant as it will appear on the screen. Love is the doctrine of our congregation. The quest for truth is our holy right, and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humankind in friendship, thus do we covenant. Every week when we meet personally in our church, we take up an offering. We do so during our worship service as an expression of gratitude for the blessing of abundance. During this time in our virtual service, please enjoy Joanne Cleland's performance of Just for Today while you contemplate your offerings of both financial support and service, or perhaps take the time to write out a check to mail tomorrow. As always, we thank you for your gifts and for your commitment to this fellowship.
The next piece is called Just For Today. I wrote the words and the music to this piece for a service 10 years ago. It talks about living in the day, not worrying about the past or the future, just living today happily. Thank you, Jill. That was beautiful, as always. Most of us know Pax <clears throat> as Emily's husband, or the man often taxed with watching uh, two or more <clears throat> of their three children during the service. But we also have discovered in him a wealth of knowledge and deep thought that he is willing to share with us through his messages. The title of his sermon today is the next right thing, stoicism and compassion in a time of crisis. Pax? Uh, well, thanks, Terry. Now I have uh, no pressure from that introduction. Um, <laughs> uh, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me back. Um, I'm really glad to see everyone taking some time out of the chaos of our 2020s to join in these services. And I'm especially appreciative to Barry and Paul and Terry and everyone who put in hard work to put this all together. Um, before the service started, Paul and I were speaking about, you know, how relatively lucky we are that this is all happening now, where we still have this technology, we can still come together, we can still have these moments um, that are very special and I think very important right now of all times. When I last spoke before the congregation in January, um, I spoke kind of at length of what I predicted to be the challenges of 2020. I remember reading off a whole rambling and extensive list. And, you know, I remember writing that sermon and I was even debating at the time whether it was excessively negative. But going back now, nowhere in that list did I think to include pandemics or quarantines, racial protests, police brutality, conspiracy theories, uh, or the intentional and enthusiastic sabotage of our democracy, such as it is. Uh, or as journalist Patrick Gray quipped recently, an awfulness turducken. You know, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Uh, it's easy to become a puddle on the floor. It's easy to want to give up, to just throw your hands up, turn your back on the world. Um, now, I won't blame you or judge you if you do, but I think right now the world is demanding more from us. It's demanding more wisdom and certainly more compassion. And to paraphrase a song from Frozen 2, uh, just take a step and step again, and it's all that you can to do the next right thing. I personally find wisdom in the study and practice of Stoicism. Uh, it's something that I discovered almost by accident, um, simply looking for a daily podcast for my morning commute. Uh, the Daily Stoic podcast, book, website at dailystoic.com really form a basis of a significant portion of my research for this morning's sermon. So if any of these things strike a chord with you, I highly recommend further reading there and the works of Ryan Holiday. 
Now, like most people, I had a preconceived notion that stoicism was about suppressing emotions and ignoring your feelings to turn oneself into a Vulcan. While this may be the outward appearance of a practicing Stoic, and in line with the word's modern usage as an adjective, the philosophy itself is instead an expression of deterministic ethics. And it's a combination of logic, physics, and naturalism to build a life of virtue. It's not suppression so much as it is transformation, applying that logic, reflection, and concentration to one's emotions in order to develop clear judgment and inner calm. The core of Stoic belief is that virtue is the only true good and that anything external is simply a tool to be used in expression of said virtue. As the philosophy was developed in ancient Greece, practitioners coalesced around four chief virtues, which were derived from Plato, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Each of these four virtues offers us a lesson now in these times of a perpetual crisis. The word philosophy literally means a love of wisdom, and the Stoics upheld this as one of their core virtues. Ancient Greek historian and biographer Diogenes Laertius wrote of the Stoics, wisdom they define as the knowledge of things good and evil, and of what is neither good nor evil, knowledge of what we ought to choose, what we ought to be aware of, and what is indifferent. For us, wisdom is the ability to recognize when to slow down, when to listen, when to learn, instead of acting impulsively and irrationally. Now imagine applying that same wisdom to social media. Not everything needs a hot take or an instant reaction. You don't have to have an opinion on everything you hear about. In fact, the wisest thing to say is often nothing at all. As Seneca says, works, not words. The second chief virtue is courage. Simply put, courage is sticking up for your principles, even when it's inconvenient. It's risking yourself for the greater good and fighting to hold the high ethical ground. It's holding on to your principles because you know they are right, even when you see others rewarded for abandoning theirs. It's speaking your mind and insisting on the truth, no matter what Facebook or the president say. Epictetus, a Roman Stoic philosopher who was born into and later escaped slavery, said it best. Two words should be committed to memory and obeyed, persist and resist. Persistence and resistance, the ethical backbone of any protest movement. We've seen it recently in the streets of Hong Kong, Beirut, Belarus, Portland. We've seen it from Greta Thunberg, from the Wall of Moms, from John Lewis, from Black Lives Matter, and hopefully we'll continue to see it. The third virtue, temperance, is often used interchangeably with self-control. This is Aristotle's golden mean, a virtuous life found somewhere in between excess and deficiency. It comes from recognizing what is essential for life and eliminating the desire for fleeting happiness. Now, if this sounds familiar uh, for you from the Buddhist Eightfold Path, it should. One linguistic root for the Buddhist practice may have been the term, the middle way. Or as Seneca put it, you ask what is the proper limit to a person's wealth? First, having what is essential, and second, having what is enough. Now I wonder how we can possibly claim to be an ethical society when we have so little of the former and zero concept of the latter. What is the point of these first three virtues? Ask yourself this, what is the point of courage if you're only standing up for your own interests? What is the point of wisdom if not to use it? We find the answer in the fourth virtue, Cicero's crowning glory of all virtues, justice. The Stoics don't mean justice in the legal sense, they mean summum bonum, the highest good. Justice is the principle which constitutes the bond of human society and of a virtual community of life. Every week, we end our services speaking of social and environmental justice, and the UUA principles reference justice repeatedly. For Cicero, the prodigious Roman statesman, justice had a broad and crucial definition. Ryan Holiday summarizes Cicero's thoughts on justice pretty perfectly. Quote, that no one do harm to another, that one use common possessions as common, private as belonging to their owners, 
that we are not born for ourselves alone, that men were brought into being for the sake of men, that they might do good to one another, that we ought to follow nature as a guide to contribute our part to the common good, good faith, steadfastness, and truth. Wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice, what do these have to do with compassion? How do I reconcile the process of transforming emotion into virtuous action with the sympathy, pity, and concern for others that we are called upon to possess? Well, the Stoics would not have seen the ethical value in performative pity, such as changing your profile picture and sending thoughts and prayers. They certainly saw the value in compassion as a motivator for action. The Latin roots of the word compassion translate as suffering together. The burden we must bear is not simply sadness or pity, but it is joining in that shared struggle. The Stoics rarely wrote directly of compassion, but their virtues intersected and overlapped with the building blocks of compassion itself, interconnectedness, social duty, and empathy. Marcus Aurelius instructed himself to meditate often on the interconnectedness and mutual interdependence of all things in the universe. He and his Stoic teachers referred to interconnectedness as sympatheia, the belief that we are all one, connected by some innate natural force. This is a theme that echoes throughout all of history and in all religions. Christians believe we are connected through God's divine plan. Interdependence is a key piece of the Buddhist concept of Dharma. The Hindu belief of Brahman is of a transcendent ultimate reality that underlies all things. And of course, Master Yoda spoke of the force that binds and penetrates all things, saying, luminous beings are we and not this crude matter. Through his lifetime, Marcus returned to this theme again and again, referencing it constantly in his writings. He wrote, human beings have been made for the sake of each other, teach them or endure them. The first step in compassion is recognizing that we are all connected at a fundamental level with each other and with nature. Humanity often thinks of itself as somehow separate from the rest of the living world to the great detriment of both. Once we recognize that all things are connected, our own social duty becomes inescapably clear. We have a responsibility to contribute to the greater good. Our duty, and indeed our purpose in life, compels us to use our powers of reason and virtue to the benefit of the world in which we are born. The reward is not as vulgar as praise or recognition, but it is in fact simply living a good life. Again, from Marcus, for all that I do, whether on my own or assisted by another, should be directed to this single end, the common benefit and harmony. This recognition of duty and connection would be impossible without empathy. Whereas sympathy is an emotional performative reaction that emphasizes a power dynamic, I am sad for you. Empathy is the ability to understand and experience the values, beliefs, reason, and autonomy of another human being. American author Dennis Lehane, who is neither a Stoic nor an ancient Roman politician, described the difference this way. Sympathy is easy. You have sympathy for starving children swatting at flies on the late night commercials. Sympathy is easy because it comes from a position of power. Empathy is getting down on your knees and looking someone else in the eye and realizing you could be them and that all that separates you is luck. While the Stoic focus on personal reflection and inner calm might seem self-centered at first, these virtues in writing should demonstrate that it is anything but. The purpose of such work, and indeed the purpose of a Stoic life, is to transcend fleeting personal desires and to serve the higher good of all. I'll allow Epictetus to sum this one up. One cannot pursue one's own highest good without at the same time necessarily promoting the good of others. A life based on narrow self-interest cannot be esteemed by any honorable measurement. 
Seeking the very best in ourselves means actively caring for the welfare of other human beings. Our human contract is not with the few people with whom our affairs are most immediately intertwined, nor to the prominent, rich, or well-educated, but to all our human brethren. And you might be thinking, well, now what? There are massive problems in the world, disease, disenfranchisement, disinformation, and we are each so very small. How can we stay focused on our duty to humanity and how can we do the next right thing? We can look to the example of Marcus Aurelius, whose personal journal meditations during his time as emperor of Rome serves as one of the iconic texts of Stoicism and provided much of the language for this sermon. During his reign, Rome suffered from the Antonine Plague, a disease which came to Rome from the east and quickly spread across the empire. People panicked and fear and rumors abounded. Travel and events were canceled. The ancient economy plunged and bodies began to pile up. Does this all sound familiar? It should. Of these events, Marcus himself would write, to bear in mind constantly that all of this has happened before and will happen again, the same plot from beginning to end, the identical staging. Produce them in your mind, as you know them from experience or from history. The court of Hadrian, of Antoninus, the courts of Philip, Alexander, Croesus, all just the same, only the people are different. This has all happened before and will all happen again. The Antonine Plague, the Black Death, the Spanish Flu, COVID, how did Marcus react? Did he publicly weep in grief and outrage, offering thoughts and prayers and nothing of substance? Did he turn in on himself and his own ego and call the plague a hoax and a plot to make him look bad? Absolutely not. He took action. He sought out the finest minds of the empire and he listened to their advice and expertise. He sold his own possessions and imperial effects, including his furniture, his jewelry, and even his clothing. He ensured that the state would pay for funerals and treatment and increased the tax burden on the wealthy citizens of Rome, many of whom had fled the capital to keep the treasury afloat. Now that plague lasted for more than 15 years, during which time Marcus paid a heavy personal price. He lost his personal fortune, he lost several children, and eventually he lost his own life. But he never wavered, and he remained absolutely resolute in his determination to do the right thing, to share the burden, to suffer together, and literally have compassion. To again quote from Ryan Holiday, be good to each other. That was the prevailing belief of Marcus's life. A disease like the plague can only threaten your life, Marcus said in meditations, but evil, selfishness, pride, hypocrisy, fear, these things attack our humanity. I'm not saying we all have to become the richest and most powerful people in the world to make a difference. Few of us could ever hope to achieve that, and those that do, well, let's just say they're not being particularly helpful in this day and age, and we'll just leave it at that. No, what I am saying is that every single one of us is capable of compassion. We can all reflect and develop the wisdom to know right from wrong and have the courage to shout it from the rooftops. We can live a life of temperance, free from the decadent vulgarities of the latest gizmos and gadgets and Black Friday sales. And every word and every action is an opportunity for justice by recognizing our bonds for the common good and doing our part to contribute to nature. We have to participate. We have to teach and we have to lead and do our part for the common good. We are not made for ourselves alone. As lofty as these ambitions are, they come with a warning. Despite our best efforts, we must still address the world as it is. There is no perfect scenario now or in any afterlife you may or may not believe. Our interconnectedness is not a single strand but a messy tangle of fibers, crisscrossing and intersecting in unpredictable ways. We will often find ourselves in a dilemma where two things we know to be right are in conflict with one another. We will have to decide what the greater good means using our own individual reasoning and logic. We might disagree and we might struggle, 
But as Epictetus said, we don't abandon our pursuits because we despair of ever perfecting them. Contrary to popular opinion and representation, Stoicism is deeply felt and profoundly optimistic. And it's that optimism to which I cling and in which I find strength and comfort. Fundamentally, Stoicism is the philosophy that we are capable of change, that we are capable of reflection and reasoned consideration. And in doing so, we can move beyond our divisive base instincts and knee-jerk emotional reactions. And we are capable of turning that reflection into action. And ultimately, that action can change the world. As Marcus wrote in his meditations, our actions may be impeded, but there can be no impeding our intentions or dispositions because we can accommodate and adapt. The mind adapts and converts to its own purposes the obstacle to our acting. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. The world isn't perfect, and it never will be, and neither will we. But we can take that next step, and we can do that next right thing. And I'd like to end now with another quote. Shockingly, this one's not from Marcus Aurelius. Uh, this comes from a moral philosophy professor, Chidi Anagagne, who is in fact a fictional character uh, from the greatest modern epic of ethics and philosophy, which was the NBC sitcom, The Good Place. He said, why do it? Why choose to be good every day if there is no guaranteed reward we can count on now or in the afterlife? I argue that we choose to be good because of our bonds with other people and our innate desire to treat them with dignity. Simply put, we are not in this alone. So, so say we all. Thanks again. Blessed be and amen. Well, thank you, Pax. That was, uh, was very enlightening. And it may surprise uh, no one that uh, in um, his references, uh, with the ref besides the references to the uh, uh, most obvious anti-Stoic of our times, uh, that the Ayn Rand Institute is also opposed to uh, Stoicism. As we extinguish our chalice at 11 o'clock, <laughs> as we extinguish our chalice and prepare to rejoin the wider community with compassion, with love, please join me in reciting our congregational mission statement as it will appear on the screen. We agree to provide a safe place to celebrate diversity, draw inspiration for living better lives, foster social and environmental justice, and compassionately support each other in our spiritual searches. Before we close the formal portion of our service, I would like to thank all those who have participated in our service today. Our musicians, Joe, Barry, and Paul, Paul for the technical aspects of our service and organization, Barry and members of the Worship Services Committee for making this virtual service possible, to all others who are helping today and working behind the scenes to keep our congregation together in these difficult times and our physical facilities in repair. And of course, to Pax Whitmore for his illuminating sermon this morning. And now we will have a slight delay as Paul ends the recording and prepares for our, our period of sharing joys and concerns. Um, actually, at this time, we've switched the postlude with the joys and concerns. So we'll be doing the postlude, then the joys and concerns. Okay. Thank you. 
This is the first you use song I fell in love with. Though below me I feel no motion Standing on these mountains and plains Far away from the rolling ocean Still my dry land heart can say I've been sailing all my life now Never harbor nor port have I known The wide universe is the ocean I travel And the earth is my blue boat Sun my sail and moon my rudder As I fly the starry seas Leaning over the edge in wonder Casting questions into the deep Drifting here with my ship's companions all we kindred pilgrim souls Making our way by the lights of the heavens In our beautiful blue boat home I give thanks to the waves upholding me Hail the great winds urging me on Greet the infinite sea before me Sing the sky my sailor song I was born upon the fast Never harbor nor port have I known. The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat home. Thank you, Paul, that was beautiful. And now for that slight pause. At this time in our service, we invite you to unmute yourself by clicking on the